welcome to Conversations in Healthcare, a video series brought to you by DRG, part of Clarivate. This series examines the healthcare ecosystem and its current business challenges and opportunities. In each episode, I'll talk to key leaders and stakeholders in the industry about how they're anticipating and navigating market dynamics. Currently, our series is focusing on the COVID-19 pandemic and the numerous challenges that it has actually unleashed on, on the healthcare industry. In line with this, I'm delighted to be joined by Christian Hogg. Uh, Christian is an executive director and CEO of ChiMed, a Hong Kong-based innovative medicines company listed on both NASDAQ and uh, London's AIM uh, market. Um, the company has ambitions to become a global leader in the discovery, development, commercialization of targeted therapies in, and immunotherapies in the oncology and autoimmune uh, diseases. With a portfolio of eight cancer drug candidates currently in clinical studies around the world, as well as a profitable commercial platform, which manufactures, markets, and distributes both prescription and consumer health products in China, which was of course the original epicenter of the pandemic, Christian is ideally placed to talk about the challenges uh, the industry is facing. So Christian, I, I hope you, and all those you care about are keeping well. And thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for having me. It's, it's great. So, so Christian, um, as I sort of you know uh, noted, uh, you guys are uh, based in Hong Kong, which was you know one of the, sort of the original uh, places that was hit by the uh, by the pandemic. Could you sort of just sort of you know, outline you know what the the sort of the most immediate impacts have been on sort of your, your business activities? Okay, um, so it is early May um, now, and uh, we, we first really got affected by this coronavirus in late January during Chinese New Year. So, you know, February, March, April, so th really three, four months of, of impact of the coronavirus on on our business and our operations. Um, initially, it was, as is always the case in a situation like this, highly disruptive and, you know, uh, problematic. I mean, nobody really knew what COVID was um, back in January. Um, there was a lot of uncertainty. Nobody had any idea of how it was going to impact our business. Uh, it was clearly very worrying for uh, our organization. I mean, we have over 5,000 people in China um, and we had, and we still have, uh, over 140 people in, in, in Wuhan and Hubei province, you know? So we, got, we had a lot of people directly affected by, by, you know, this outbreak and the subsequent lockdown. Um, so yeah, back then in late January and very early February, it was carnage, basically. Um, but, you know, we've got a, as many companies do, we have a fantastic team of people on the ground in China, outside of China, running our operations. We've built our business up over 20 years uh, and have been able to attract really high quality um, people into our organization. So when high quality people are, you know, um, threatened by a, a major disruption to the business, the first thing you do is you start trying to figure out how to improvise and how to work around it. So the first couple of weeks of, of, um, of February were spent um, in lockdown. The, the Chinese government basically stopped all travel. Um, and, you know, when Chinese New Year holidays were over, people went back to work, but they were working from their homes and just trying to figure out how do we, how do we run our operations? Now, our operations are quite complicated. We have, as you mentioned, we have large scale commercial operations, manufacturing and, 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 and uh, commercialization of our own products. We sell over 200 products in China. We have a commercial team of over 3,000 people on the ground across China, covering 25,000 hospitals in China. Um, and so, you know, it's a big organization spread out everywhere. 
Um, so we had to think about, okay, is this going to affect manufacturing? Is this going to affect supply chains and logistics? How are we going to get products to the, to the, to the patient? How that the patient doesn't want to go to the hospital because they're all, you know, um, nervous about going into hospital. So we, we, we broke it down and, and I'd say within two weeks, we had it all figured out. Um, basically the, the intra China logistics was a bit of a challenge initially because you weren't allowed to ship products across provincial borders. Um, but after about a week in sort of early February that relaxed and we were able to figure that out. Manufacturing, we had to, we've got over, you know, b between just, just south of a thousand people in manufacturing facilities in China. So we had to figure out, look, if we're bringing our manufacturing people back to, back to the, the factories after Chinese New Year, we had to provide, make sure there was social distancing, make sure they had sufficient um, protective equipment, uh, face masks, etc., cetera, um, to, to protect them basically. And so that took a bit of time uh, to figure out because suddenly everyone in China needed to get face masks. Um, but we were able to open our manufacturing facilities basically a week later than planned after Chinese New Year. Uh, and, and that wasn't for us an issue because we had plenty of inventory. So um, the, the commercial side of the business was actually relatively straightforward from a manufacturing and product distribution standpoint. The marketing side of it was tricky because you've got 2,500 medical reps across China who their, their business is interacting with the physician, face to face with the physician, setting up small meetings with groups of physicians to detail and explain the product. And obviously that was completely interrupted. So what we had to do is we had to figure out, okay, all these medical reps out there, what are they gonna do? And you know, they, again, they improvised, they figured out, okay, we will do virtual meetings, we will, we will interact with physicians either by telephone or by, by uh, video calls, um, you know, setting up group webinars to, to detail the products, <clears throat> etc. So it was, you know, commercial people are, you know, have high levels of ingenuity, and they figured it out pretty quick. So by the end of February, um, that first month of sort of COVID, I would say our commercial businesses were operating at about 95% um, normal operations, 95. By the end of March, close to 100%. Um, by the end of March in China, the hospitals had settled down. Um, medical reps still not allowed into the hospitals, but a, a lot more interaction was allowed. <clears throat> and so, and also the, because of the lockdown in China, the Chinese government, I, in my opinion, did a very good job containing it as best they could. And so, you know, that, that took a lot of pressure off the, off the hospital system in China and allowed things to kind of go back to, you know, relative, kind of a new normal. Um, so that's kind of what happened by the end of March. April has been solid. You know, and, uh, you know, as I say, close to close to normal. When I look at the commercial business, we see, OK, the, the, the main metric is what about your sales and what about your profits during that period? And as I look at it, um, it is about as we expected. Um, so all in all, patients who are on drugs for chronic disease, they're going to figure out how to get their prescriptions. They may not want to go to the hospital to get them. So maybe they go to the retail pharmacies to get them. They, they figured it out and we didn't see any real drop off in, in the commercial side of our business. On the research and the innovation side of our business, much more complicated and much yeah. more hospital focused. Um, you know, interaction, daily interaction on, on all of our clinical trials. And what we found <clears throat> was that, um, you know, China is a, Obviously, during February, there was a lot of disruption. So all the clinical trials, the new enrollment of studies just shut down. No patients were going to go and, and, and try to be screened to get on a clinical trial during February just because of the situation. So new enrollment shut down. But 
for studies that were up and running, particularly large scale phase three studies where you have literally hundreds of patients on the study, receiving drug, having, having regular consultations with their oncology clinicians, you know, having to go in to have tumor assessments, uh, having to go into the hospital, get their drugs. That, that was also influenced. Now we have, we have a particular study that's currently got maybe about 450 people uh, already enrolled. Some of them are already off the study, but call it 400 plus people on it. Um, I would say the number of people on that study that there was some kind of an interruption, maybe they couldn't go to see their clinician, maybe um, they, missed a, they missed a tumor assessment. Um, I'd say the total number was maybe 15% of patients. Oh. There was some kind of a some kind of a, an issue with 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 you know not a protocol violation necessarily but a but a, a an interruption. <clears throat> what we were able to do quite successfully is make sure everybody had their their uh, their study drug. Um, so if they couldn't get to the hospital, we were able to you know ship product to their houses to to ensure that they actually were able to continue the treatment. So really, and we were also able to set up uh, telephone calls and video calls with their clinicians to, to monitor safety and to ensure that they were okay. Um, when I say maybe 10, 15% of patients, there was some kind of impact, that, that's generally the CT scan, bringing them to the hospital, having a CT scan. You know, you have to come to the hospital for that. And for that, it, it, was, it was challenging, although we did arrange for certain patients to go to local clinics that were less affected by COVID to have their you know, CT scans. So, you know, again, it was improvisation. Certain things were more difficult than others, but, you know, for the most part, um, we, we kind of made our way through February. In March, we saw sort of early March, still a bit challenging, but by the end of March, kind of back to normal, um, you know, um, enrollment in our in our studies rising again um, back to maybe not totally back to normal but certainly back to sort of 70 80 percent of normal enrollment of new patients into our studies um, and in you know in in uh, in that so that was the end of March in April it's just got better still so I think you know what we've been at this for three months we've been through the pain in the early days um, and you know human beings are pretty resourceful people um, particularly you know high quality um, you know science driven people that are trying to help patients they figure it out and so where we are today is is I'd say we're in a pretty good spot um, and you know I feel for obviously I feel for everybody in the UK Europe North America that are going through the pain that I went through in February, you know, they're going through that now. Um, but, you know, the, the only thing I can say on a high level is that um, it, it will pass and, you know, give it, give it two or three months. Um, I think, you know, most businesses in this field, in the healthcare field, in the biotech field, where we're running these studies, where we're getting, you know, essential medicines out to patients across the world, most businesses, I think, will will settle down uh, back to a kind of a new normal, uh, and um, you know should be okay so long as there's not another big big spike uh, and outbreak. Yeah, you mentioned that there were um, sort of changes, you know, kind of re-engineered process, or I think sort of said that, you know your, uh, your your staff were ingenious to be able to improvise where new processes were brought in of those processes say for example such as sort of, you know virtual discussions with uh, you know the hospitals etc which of those do you think actually you will continue to uh, maintain and and which were just temporary and actually you know, it got you through the the, the hiatus so um you know, digital um, marketing and digital platforms in the in the 
medical detailing and sort of interaction with physicians field has been building up over the last five years. It's a bit like Zoom and all these, all these video, um, video platforms we're using for these kinds of interaction. They've all, they're all there and they've all been created over the last five or 10 years. Um, they just haven't been broadly adopted because there hasn't been a need. And well, the old habit was medical reps going into hospitals and meeting doctors. The old habit was an interview like this would be done face to face uh, with, with a camera crew taking, taking, taking a photo, or, you know, pictures of it. So that was the old well entrenched system. It needed something like COVID to shake it all up and to, to get people to uh, adopt, you know, new, new uh, uh, tools for communication. And I think digital marketing is a big one. I, I was on a panel the other day, another webinar panel with the, uh, the head of AstraZeneca in Asia, um, Leon, Leon Wang. And Leon, you know, Leon, AstraZeneca and China have a very close collaboration on Savalitinib. We're getting ready to, to launch it in China together. And Leon was saying, you know, I can't remember the exact numbers, but he was saying that their digital platform reaches out literally hundreds of thousands of physicians globally, and in China, tens of thousands of physicians, and that they've successfully launched three new drug uh, uh, launches uh, over the last couple of months in China using their digital platform. So it didn't slow them down. COVID didn't slow them down. And I think you know, when you get forced into using these kinds of uh, new uh, um, tools, you get used to it and you start realizing actually sort of 90 for 10, you know, you get 90% of the result for 10% of the, of, the, uh, of the effort. So you may as well. Um, so I would imagine a lot of these things will, will now, have now become well established and will only gather um, momentum as we go forward. So it, it, it's, it's a sort of a process of it was happening and the, the pandemic just kind of accelerated yeah. uh, that, that, that change. Right. So, so just sort of looking at it, you know, the, 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 I guess the sort of the impact of the pandemic is kind of abating uh, in, in, in China. Um, what, what is sort of the, the, the long term Sort of, you know, impacts though you think that that pandemic is going to have. You know, we know, for example, there's you know, economic disruption. We know that there was, you know, clearly a big challenge on healthcare systems everywhere. What what do you think the challenges are, and what should the pharmaceutical industry be doing to kind of alleviate, you know, some of the stress? Um, well, I, you know, I mean, I, I think, I think <clears throat> it would be naive to be sitting here right now and saying, oh, you know, it's all over and, you know, let's assess what the long-term implications are. You know, we are, you know, I say to you, we are, my business, my, my business of, of producing and distributing uh, pharmaceutical products, prescription pharmaceutical products, as well as developing, um, um, discovering and developing um, innovative oncology drugs. My business is kind of back to normal today or normal and relative normality. But I'm under no illusions that this, that this COVID uh, crisis is over. You know, it's not. This thing is, even though, you know, you might sit sitting here in Hong Kong as I am today, you know, we've got 1,041 cases. Um, there's not been a new case for the last, you know, week or so. Um, the only new cases in Hong Kong are those that fly in from outside of Hong Kong, but they're all caught at the airport because they have, they have immediate testing. The individuals are required to wait until the test results are available. Um, if they're negative for COVID, they go off for 14 days into quarantine, um, which is quite strictly controlled. And as a result, Basically, you've got no COVID in Hong Kong. Um, but the reality is this thing could kick off again really quickly if, if 
these constraints are lifted uh, too rapidly. Um, they're thinking about sending the kids back to school here shortly, and you know things are things are moving, so it's working. But the reality is, we're going to be living with this thing until there's a vaccine. That's probably going to be middle of next year. And as a result, the sort of I, I see the answer to your question is sort of two phases. One is the intermediate phase uh, from now until the middle of next year. I think what you're going to see is a lot less travel. <laughs> I think now the good thing is for ChiMed is that we have people in all the markets that we we operate in the United States, in China, in Hong Kong, pretty much everywhere we operate. So our people on the ground everywhere are able to operate in their particular environment. Hong Kong is easy now because it's, it's relatively stable. The US obviously is a lot more challenging. I think it'll take a couple of months for that to settle down. China is you know, pretty straightforward at the moment. So during that intermediate stage, I think there's just going to be really, really strict uh, constraints around sort of cross-border travel. Um, it's not going to be because we as a company have a policy of that. It's going to be because the governments of each of these countries have policies and make it impossible for me to nip up to Shanghai because it, it'd be 14 days of quarantine on the way and 14 days coming back. You know, it's not practical. So. That's the intermediate period. I think continuing the way we are today, probably for another year, uh, with with all this video conferencing and and sort of making do in our local market, you know, occupying ourselves and, and running our businesses that way. I think beyond that, uh, as we get into sort of the post-COVID period, um, I think. A lot of things will go back to normal. Um, I do think that there will be um, a, a lot more awareness of these kinds of um, uh, outbreaks. I mean, I was, I was here in Hong Kong in 2003 during SARS, and Hong Kong was the epicenter of SARS worldwide. Um, it was traumatic, to say the least. Um, but within a year or two after SARS went away, it was completely back to normal. And, but, but Hong Kong people were, were, you know, really sensitized to the need for, you know, hygiene, hand washing, wearing face masks, all of these things. And, and I think that's why in Hong Kong, you go out in the street, everybody is wearing a face mask um, because they understand that it actually is beneficial to those around you if you're wearing a face mask. Um, so I think that's probably one of the reasons there's no new cases in Hong Kong is that there's such, you know, really good dis social distancing, really good hygiene, really good awareness. You know, you get on a bus, you don't touch the handrails, <laughs> you know, these kind of common sense things. Um, I think the UK and, and the West is going through a similar traumatic experience that, that Hong Kong went through back in 2003 and learned these tough lessons. Um, and I think once that's happened, people in the West are going to be much more aware. They're going to be much more careful. And, you know, hopefully the governments around the world will, you know, actually take action to be able to identify these, these viruses earlier and to close them down before they spread. Uh, thanks very much for um, talking to us today. I mean, this, this, this has been fascinating, the sort of the experience and the sort of the learnings from, from what you've um, actually experienced. Um, and also the fact that there is a sort of, there's a sort of a sense of optimism, the fact that, you know, within a few months, you know, business is kind of getting stuck you know, slightly back to normal, uh, at least in terms of you know, productivity, etc. So, you know, thanks very much. Those insights, I think, are going to, I mean, they're going to resonate with other leaders, but I think they'll also give them a, a, you know, a sense, sense of you know, some optimism. Uh, oh, totally, totally. I, so, I think everybody should be optimistic. This thing, this thing will pass. And, um, you know, I mean, again, I have to be sensitive. I'm in an industry in which we are producing 
essential medicines that patients need. You know, we're, we're not in a non-essential industry. Um, hospitality, airline, all of these things, and you know, those guys are going to have a are going to have a hard time. But but I think it will pass, and absolutely, people should be optimistic. Yeah. So well, uh, yeah. I well, I wish you and your company well. I mean, the work you do, you know, especially at this at this sort of critical time, is is you know uh, very important. So if if after listening uh, to this broadcast, you've got questions for either me or or for Christian, um, please click the link at the end of the video, and because we'd love to hear from you, we'd love to get your feedback, and um, because that will help us shape. Uh, the sort of conversations in healthcare as, as we go forward. If you'd like to tune in, follow our LinkedIn page. Um, again, we'll be posting alerts to, to future episodes as they come, come across. So in closing, I, I'd like to thank you know, Christian again uh, for joining us and, and also thank uh, the listeners for uh, participating. I'd also like to, uh, to say well, thank you and show appreciation to all those, um, and, and this is also from uh, my colleagues at DRG and, and Clarivate, we'd like to thank all those who, you know, in the healthcare system, who are working tirelessly to help people survive this crisis. So uh, we're all indebted to you. So thank you very much. Uh, so until next time, stay safe. Uh, I'm Mike Ward, and I'll see you in the next episode.